All right, good afternoon. Welcome to the third of three expanded dialogues organized by our colleagues in the Center for Expanded Poetics. Today, our guests will tackle molecular selves in organic humanity. We at Force Space recognize the Kanyankahaga Nation as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Jojage, or Montreal, where Force Space is located on unceded indigenous land, has long been a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous settlers immigrants and refugees. We want to express our respect for the longstanding Indigenous presence in Montreal and our solidarity with decolonizing work. For those of you joining us, uh, am I, can you hear me? You're back on, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure at what point you lost me, but uh, I guess I was just saying welcome on behalf of Force Space and I'll just let you know that you, you've you entered our, our virtual channel whereby we collaborate with our community at Concordia to make the research initiatives and course activities happening across the university publicly accessible through interactive and engaging experiences such as today's. So I'll just note that we are recording and streaming the session and I'll put those links in the chat in a moment. And our organizers, Marlena and Fenton, will explain a little bit about the proceedings now in a minute. You're, as, you'll, as you'll note, you're more than welcome to join in the conversation. Okay, on that note, I give the floor over to you. Fenton, Marlena, welcome in. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, so hi, everybody, and welcome to our third event of the um, Expanded Dialogue Symposium. And today's topic is um, on molecular selves uh, in organic uh, humans. And so um, my name is Marlene Oeffinger. I'm a PhD, second year PhD student in the Department of English and an affiliate of the Center for Expanded Poetics. And uh, my research uh, in my PhD focuses on the molecular uh, and to think about molecular selves also combine it with an idea of the philosophical selves and the literary selves for poetry. Fintan, you want to introduce yourself too? Sure, yeah, no, for, for sure. Thanks, Marlena. Uh, hi, my name is Fintan Nealon. Uh, I'm a research intern at the Center for Expanded Poetics. Um, I'm also doing a PhD in philosophy. Um, yeah, so this is more, um, I won't relate my research to this because it's much more on uncertainty. Um, but I'll actually just get into a description of the event itself um, to push us forward. So I'm just going to say welcome as well to all of you for the final part of our Expanded Dialogue Symposium series, uh, where we seek to uh, explore issues of uncertainty and selfhood through a conversational form. Um, our dialogue today will address these concerns under the title of Molecular Selves in Organic Humanity. Um, so I guess to, to put it in a question form, does the advent of a molecular or inorganic vision of humanity and taking those words or considering them in their broadest possible sense. So take it out what you will. So do they threaten a disruption or a revision or a displacement of the way that we know ourselves? Um, and could a more generally accessible image of a molecular human avert um, future crises like we have right now, be that in obviously an epidemiological one or indeed in the more broader environmental one. And I could list off a bunch of others, but I'll, I'll, I'll stay there. A uh, brief word on the Expanded Dialogues project. This is, our, as I said, our third and final um, iteration. Um, over the past few months, we've sought to create a space online for accidental encounters and interrogations of concepts through an unpredictable and unanticipatable association of ideas. We do this via a format um, in which the focus is on participants articulating their perspectives on a given issue rather than say them defending a given position or so. So there's no papers, for example. What we find and what we this project aims to do is generate surprising and unpredictable common grounds between each of our speakers. Temporary plateaus of shared interest, which no one could have foreseen arising beforehand. And our hope is that these will serve as grounds for the seeds of future research collaboration. So with that all of the way, the, the, um, the spirit of the event out of the way, um, we have five speakers today. Um, Marie Lecouye, um, I hope I got that right, Marie. Um, Effie Morris, um, Rusbash Shadpi, again, I hope I got that one right too. Paisley Conrad and Cheda Yaglorimas. Uh, the format as our, our previous event We'll have a warm up period um, of two speakers. That'll be Marie and Effie. Um, that'll run for about 15 minutes or so. 
And once the 15 minutes has elapsed, which you will see with a timer, um, we will start sequentially adding a new participant every 10 minutes. So that's going to be Roosbeth first, then Paisley, then Cheda. That'll take about 45 minutes as a whole. And at that point, we will, anyone who is in the audience, we are going to upgrade you to um, full participant status so you can join in if you would like. The conversation will, as it's described, keep expanding. Um, with that all out of the way, I'm going to let the unanticipatable connections commence and hand things over to Effie and Marie. So if you two want to take it away, um, thanks very much. Enjoy the conversation. Enjoy it. Hi, everyone. So um, I, Effie, are you ready? I am, yes. Please, please go ahead. OK, up to you. Uh, so my name is Marie Lécuyer. I'm a PhD candidate here at Concordia University. I'm doing my PhD in, in anthropology. And I'm also a visiting fellow at the City University at the School of Creative Media in Hong Kong. And my research, so the part of the research I will be talking about today is about plastic waste mostly. I've been following up plastic in urban areas in, in Canada in the past years, and I took it to the ocean as well. And this led me to following container ships in, from, from Montreal to other port cities. And uh, I've been following plastics waste uh, at sea in rivers with the biologists and scientists. Um, ab, uh, on board of a scientific expedition two years ago. So I'll be mostly talking about this as a, as a warm up, so as to attend to the, the kind of becoming between waste, plastic and humans and how we deal with, with unwanted materials like, like this one. And I'll be showing a short video as well to, to open up also on questions of, of methodologies of how we attend to those uh, inorganic becomings uh, as, uh, as the organizers uh, opened up with. Um, um, so maybe I can start actually now with a short video before actually describe anything. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, so there's a, a, a translation uh, from French to English. I hope it's not too bad, but you, you, you will see for yourself. Okay, can you see everyone? À l'usine au niveau de l'eau, ta roule prend un trip et me garde éveillée. Depuis ma banette, Dans le ventre d'un laboratoire photo, le son de l'écume va se forme à notre passage d'un laboratoire de mon travail interne. Le son de l'écume. I'll stop sharing now. So this was my attempt here was kind of a, of a poetic video where um, I put in the foreground some noises of plastics. And I also have this voiceover, which is mine, um, but where I'm not even really illustrating anything, not even explaining anything, but I'm also trying to actually uh, invoke the plastic that you know we were hunting. And this is the kind of main point of, of, of my research here is like the hunting of the plastic became some kind of haunting that in the sense that the plastic was really, um, you know, motivating us in our expedition, fueling the expedition, like gathering some all kind of attention that were actually translated into enough money for the for the expedition to to work. And, and plastic also appeared to me as a ghost in a sense. 
because it was, you know, coming back from being buried and contained by all kind of managerial efforts that ultimately fail. And so this coming back of the plastic to the surface and the work of scientists to really look for it, to me really kind of incarnated this uh, kind of, of ghost that you know, was really present in everything we did from discussions to, to movements. So we, uh, we, we were kind of bewitched by this, by this plastic, it seemed to me. And my main point of contention here is that you know, this expedition was framed on the yes, idea of looking for the origins of plastic pollution. And it seems to me that those discourses of you know, going back to the source of like port cities, obviously, and all kind of industrial areas really missed the point and actually absorbed the, the overall responsibility and uh, overall uh, history tied to plastic pollution that goes back to um, but that goes you know, in relation to uh, container ship traits, which does not appear in the video, but which appears later, I mean, later it appears. So plastic pollution is related to the uh, historical, um, to a history of trade and a history also of transatlantic trade. So this kind of um, um, discourse about immunity of getting rid of the material and uh, and uh, really portraying it as, as a foe in a sense um, is really missing the point you know, of, of, uh, of more political, um, political issues that you know, in, in the end tend to be reinforced because we never question the systems of production and consumption that are at play here. Um, so I could go on and go on, but uh, I shall also, uh, open up the floor. So maybe I'll come back later on as a, to keep on with questions for the other panelists as we continue our, our round. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I'm excited to take up many of the sort of provocations that you um, just laid out for us. Um, and I think we'll have um, much to talk about um, also in relation to the question that um, the organizers of this amazing event has put together. Um, I'll start with sort of a quick introduction of um, what I'm sort of interested in talking about today. Um, and then maybe we can get into a discussion. Um, I'm going to start by reading um, a brief abstract um, to sort of frame my interests and then um, possibly talk about um, a body of poetry that I've been working on that um, looks at the sort of uh, implications of cells and selves as they sort of um, coalesce and morph in that lovely um, interchange of the similarity of that word um, for ideas of radical intimacy and in queer bodies and queer loneliness. Um, but I'll start by reading this abstract. Um, choreographer and dancer Deborah Hay utilizes all 53 trillion cells in her body to imagine and access her full range of potential and movement. She writes, I imagine every cell in my body has the potential to perceive action, resourcefulness, and cultivation at once. By coming into awareness of the microscopic community of our bodies, how might Hay's provocation allow for greater attention, trans individuation, and radical intimacy between bodies? The distancing, dysphoric, and ongoing experience of COVID-19 complicates how the bodily imaginary is constructed in terms of touch, the unseen, proximity, and closeness. Refocusing our bodies as cosmologically embedded within a biological fabric of collectivity assembles the radicalizing force of an embodied poetics and nature-centric outlook. Perceiving the cellular potential within our bodies fosters the joy of a somatic, free falling into the formlessness and living within the perpetual question. So I'm really taking um, this idea from choreographer Deborah Hayes and thinking through what it means to come into awareness, right, of the trillions of cells within our bodies and really what that sort of um, unsettles in terms of this, um, lack of touch and intimacy that we've experienced during the pandemic. 
um, this sort of like almost fear of other bodies and how we might utilize this instead to, um, yeah, really, really, as I said, think about our bodies as these, um, um, these communities, right, of cells in relation to other selves. Um, so I'm just going to read a couple of poems from this um, body of work. And um, none of them are titled since they're all in a body together, um, but I will sort of jump around and read some individual um, poems. I write cells led by cells, prismatic division to understand self split down poems, looky center. The dance is still inside of skins, biome, we wiggle, the meiosis two-step, lying alive, stirring coral splendor, ouch, small silver split. Um, just a moment, let me locate this other poem. Lover says loneliness is a sensation like hunger, a weight gain. Deborah lies down and does not move, dancing intently. Queer loneliness named might be something like that. To make stillness a choice, notice the moment and let it go. Notice the moment and let it go of the extreme present atomic now being a series of rebirths and guilt killings that allow this bruise to exist. Now green, gold, banana brown, now purple, rising umber, held in body, it repeats. I write these bruised poems, tall in my imagination, to belly bad belief, to stop arrival, to feel movement as blood and buzzing and bruising and blooming every which way in every dimension. This is the last one I'll read. I've burned my finger again, yellow this time still. The warmest chord is a lyric I repeat and can't understand for all the long lessons, restless on the edge of afternoon. Breath of my very DNA. If blacks were just inverted blues, that's what this is. Blue moon and blue cape. I keep the burn pointed above the other fingers. Proud mannequin hand in solitude season. Place doesn't wait and doesn't ask. Please come upstairs with me. I beg it. Um, thank you. So um, Maria, I don't know if you have um, anywhere you'd like to um, start. Um, I also have um, some ideas as well, but please, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for sharing. It's uh, it's very beautiful and 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 it really um, echoes some of the thoughts on my on my end as well. So to me, this this also relate to this uh, maybe question methodology methodological question of like how do we render visible and sensible those kind of multiplicities and how do you also um, deviate from um, um, the kind of uh, discourses, as I was trying to say, that really uh, kind of bound the body, the body to one entity without taking into uh, account uh, everything that kind of affect it and transform it every uh, all the time. So I don't know if this is a question that the rest of the panel will be interested in, but this is also what uh, in the video I was trying to do uh, in the way by invoking plastics, I tried to move away from containerization and, and immunity to really kind of uh, um, invoke and um, plastics and the kind of ecologies that emerge from you know, processes of, of globalization in, in spite of those processes here. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I, I'm really fascinated by your idea of origins and I apologize for the noise. It just started pouring here. So let me just close my window one minute. Again, so sorry, we have just a huge thunderstorm that arrived two seconds ago. Um, 
But um, yes, I love this question of ghosts and origins because I think it is so easy to sort of like remove our bodies and create this removal from the plastics that we are in constant use with. Like what is, what is the sort of relationship between us and our old toothbrush that now exists at the bottom of the ocean? Um, and how to sort of foster a greater understanding of um, us as organic beings with these or inorganic objects that we are in constant sort of um, touch with um, and in constant sort of um, denial of, of the waste that we are creating um, and this sort of, um, yeah, the, one of the panelists said at the beginning, this, this sort of um, threat or disruption, right, of our vision of self. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that word is really interesting, that threat, because it is very threatening to sort of come into terms with our, our, the origins of these plastics and to sort of come into um, also at the same time, this sort of understanding or re-understanding of, of selves. Yes, and there's, there's also this, this question of consciousness, and it seems to me that poetry may be one way also of, of uh, bringing to consciousness what we also take for granted and do and think without even actually thinking about it. So in the, in the case of plastic, let's say, it's like it's very present in our lives, but it seems to me in a very unconscious way, maybe put it that way. And so then it becomes about, you know, how do we, how do we learn to know again about those devices that we that we use on the on a daily basis? Um, and so there's Gilbert Simondon, for instance, that talks about alienation in that sense with the machine. That you know mm -hmm. we've entered the regime of consumption that is such that we don't even um, spend time enough to repair, to re, to 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 reuse the stuff that we that we have. And so this is a question also about uh, um, making, like, um, maybe inventing artful ways of, uh, of techno-diversity of some kind in ways that also does not perpetuate the kind of colonial and racist regimes that actually put those uh, um, consumption use in the, in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Um, and Yes, I loved what you said about the unconscious, right? Because um, yeah, to maybe begin with poetry, I do think that it um, fosters this, this potential for attention, right? And this potential for um, becoming conscious of our sort of um, habitudes, right? And the sort of um, nefarious banality that um, a lot of these uses have become because they're so, um, so continuously practiced on a daily basis, they become, yes, like ghosts, they sort of fall into the background. And I think that coming into attention of those things is um, maybe the first step in um, applying some of the more sort of practical uh, methods that you um, mentioned. And also coming into attention, like you said, of the colonial and transatlantic nature of these um, production methods. Um, and to remember that rather than to allow the sort of capitalism and um, late capitalism, neoliberalism to sort of obfuscate those, those histories um, as they, they're so keen to do. Um, so I, I think this idea of um, unconsciousness um, and, and perhaps how sort of a transcorporality, right? Of being in sort of um, awareness of not just inorganic, but other organic beings and to create a sort of non-hierarchical method of our sort of molecular beings um, might also help to sort of reframe um, our ability for consciousness. And, and also with your video, I loved the sort of poetics. Um, we saw just a short clip of that, but um, it also just um, instantly sort of took us to this place of embodiment and resonance that I think um, pairs so well with sort of your, your research as well and that, that sort of um, potential for, um, yeah, like I said, embodiment and the potential that poetry has to sort of underline um, these issues. Yeah, and I tried to, to, to play actually, if I may say one word about this before all the panelists comes, come in, is the, um, the ripple, ripple effect of, of the voice, which I know kind of um, 
disrupt the whole meaning of the sentence in the sense that it becomes even harder to actually grasp the words that are being said. Uh, but that was also the purpose that I was um, trying to, to, to achieve, to actually um, kind of perform the, the refraction of different uh, perspectives within, within those words and how they amplify sometimes one another. So you tend to hear one word repeated and this, this one becomes clear and how in those ripple effects, sometimes you have uh, words that are intersecting one another and canceling one another out. So well, that's also ties into this idea that the kind of uh, ecologies that emerge from, from those uh, capitalist spaces are not necessarily harmonious in any way. So they are also disruptions and uh, all on continuing transformation. And what also I had in mind while working on this project was moving from immunity to this concept of community. And so in that sense, I looked at the way plastic communicates, not that it necessarily speaks, that's not me anthropomorphizing the, the plastic, but really how it circulates through media. And so you had like, um, and so that's also how, how the ghost kind of emerges as a media effect in the sense that plastic kind of gets diffracted through media, whether that be analogical uh, through the ocean, let's say, because plastic kind of breaks down indefinitely, it never really dissolves, it never disappears. And it also diffracts on the kind of contemporary media that journalists, uh, scientists and communication people really use um, on board to, you know, bring attention and, and sensibility to this issue, but then it's always a question of like, what kind of sensibility do we bring? And, and to what extent those discourses kind of reify stuff we already know and that are problematic. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yes, the, the horror of plastic never sort of um, breaking down and staying with us and now creating sort of um, embedding itself in the very geological structure of our um, planet is um, one that, yeah, threatens a, a, a capitalist vision that's perpetuated through media, right? But at the same time is one that we can't, can't ignore. Um, and I think the sort of words that you use about um, it being defracted um, creates this sort of like, I feeling of removal um, from plastic. And I love the idea of like a dialogue with plastic, a sort of like um, um, having to come to terms with our own sort of like waste and our own sort of use um, through this idea of community, because it does really feel like we perpetuate this idea, and I use we very broadly, of uh, immunity to our sort of consumption plastic. Um, and so I think this idea of thinking about the fragmentary nature of plastic and how it embeds in our lives feels like an important sort of um, way of framing this idea of coming to terms with the sort of like community aspect that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And if I may add, it also um, brings to, to my mind this, how um, you know metaphors like islands of plastics as well, um, and um, ideas of, of recycling sometimes, and at any kind of attempts to solve ecological issues uh, or technical issues, um, kind of you know, really again perpetuate this you know this island to be conquested, to 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 be taken over by, to to become. To be acquired. So these kind of colonial narratives really, uh, really interestingly or strangely, um, kind of emerge through different means, through non-human also uh, dimensions such as plastics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean the floating islands themselves, like you said, yeah, very much brings to mind the sort of like colonial nature um, that sort of has like perpetuated and extended all of this into our um, into our contemporary. Um, but I think that we're going to be joined in a moment by our other panelists, if I understand correctly. Hello, hi. Hi. Um, 
Hi everyone, I'm Ruzbe. I'm an artist and musician and researcher um, with a background in medicine, psychiatry and uh, music. And um, thank you both of you um, for that lovely beginning of discussion. There's a lot of things I, I want to follow up on um, regarding waste, plastic, the organic, the inorganic. But I also want to kind of create a radical departure in what was being said and maybe introduce a bit of a cut in the fold and see where that goes, particularly because um, a lot of my thinking and work is anchored in decoloniality. And we spoke a bit about the colonial issues um, at stake in these questions of the molecular, of the self even, but not enough, I think. And so I think I will introduce a few thoughts and we'll see how it all meshes together. Um, and I'll start by saying that we talk about, in the questions of this panel, we speak about of the molecular and its impacts without questioning if it impacts at all. Um, to disrupt a world nature human axis requires that we begin with a coherent world nature human axis in the first place. Um, I think alongside many decolonial thinkers, I don't believe that this is such an entity in racialized and colonized people. Presuming harmonious co-substantiations between body and the world is anchored in a perceptual primacy and fueled by a reductionist biophysiological determinism. And so I want to just talk about Axel Carrera, who thinks through Fanon's work in Black Skin, White Mass, and notes that the Merleau-Ponty's corporeal schema um, can't account for the historically overdetermined lived experience of people of color. And when Fanon says, and I quote, I thought I was asked to construct a physiological self to balance space and localize sensations, when all the time they were clamoring for more. Fanon understands the physiological self as a myth of colonialism. For the colonized, the seemingly simplest of physiological tasks, breathing, sleeping, localizing sensation, are always enmeshed in the colonial matrix of social, historical, and material conditions. And I often think that we have, instead of addressing the biocentric cosmology within which race operates in, we kind of revert to this social construct of race within this hylomorphic logic of race forming the matter on which it applies, the biological matter on which it applies. We can talk about hylomorph hylomorphism with regards to plastics as well, with regards to Simon Don and his notions of information. Um, but I really wanna echo here Catherine McKittrick, who in turn echoes Sylvia Winter when she acknowledges that the scientific self is inseparable from the experience of black living. These questions we ask today are not new questions. These disruptions are not new disruptions. Ms. McKittrick states, Race is the fiction we must physiologically live with and through as racial violence, just as it provides the conditions of being black that refuse our present system of knowledge. So molecularly, McKittrick might be talking about Arlene Geronimus' studies on the increased allo allostatic loads in black people called weathering, which dates all the way back to 1992. Or maybe she's referring to the 15th century in the Spanish Inquisition, which introduced the concept of limpieza de sangre, purity of blood as a statute of arguably what we call biological racism. Either way, I want to note that questions of the molecular and its influence on the self are perhaps more aptly stated as, of, as questions of the molecular and how we perceive racialized others. And that these are not new and that they may in fact go all the way back to the 15th century. And we do not need microscopes. We do not need x-rays. We, we do not need to know about DNA or organelles or mitochondria or bacteria to think of the molecular, which is in itself a scalar intervention and a question of measure. And measure 
in its attempt to make transparent, I think Marie, you said, how do we render visible the multiplicities? Well, I would like to say perhaps we should not render them visible. Perhaps we should keep them opaque and echoing Edouard Glissant's claim for the right to opacity as a right to be unknown, to keep our multiplicities away from the molecular gaze, away from molecular vision. And so I'll end that with the words of Nicki Minaj when she says, you see right through me, how do you do that shit? And I think what she means is, you don't do that shit, stop looking. I'm sorry if that was a bit of a left swing, but I just felt like these were things that I needed to put out there if we were gonna talk about molecular selves. Thank you, Rosebe, for your comments. I don't know if I should say something before somebody else comes in, um, but I really also enjoyed your, your reference to this concept of uh, our idea of transparency here, and I and I do agree too that those you know uh, ideologies of transparencies are, are also pretty uh, pretty pr problematic in the way they expose, indeed. And so I did not mean uh, to to render visible in the sense of uh, of um, of a wire of a wire gaze uh, that that really sets a good questions actually but and and you know I mean to speak on just on my end because I can only do that um, I was you know trying to listen to something else so. Um, maybe speaking of transparency would have been to listen actually or to look at um, the kind of immediacies and all too common you know kind of accounts that we have but um, looking at you know looking at the noises that we always discard so much is also a way to kind of deviate from homogeneous kind of conversations so um, like I see those noises also have xenopoetic events to some extent that also have, um, not also, but they, they, they are important in the conversation in the way we, we attend to, to, to stuff. That's a very vague response to, to your very uh, interesting comments, um, but I would need more time. Yeah. To actually reflect on everything you said. Okay. Yeah, I mean, m maybe, as a, maybe as a more direct, link to, to your work, Marie, and what you brought up. I've, I was thinking about, you speak about waste and the plastic, and maybe to take um, a decolonizing and approach to that, I think of the work of Mel Chen, Mel Y. Chen, and their work on um, the racializing of toxicities and the toxicity of inorganic matter, which when ingested is never digested, but becomes this assemblage of with the organic body, its host. And so Mel speaks about the example of lead toxicity, for example. Lead, which is an inorganic material but which ends up having such huge impact on the health of the bodies that it that ingested, that incorporated. Bodies which are often racialized bodies, people of color, color living in public housing, for example. And so I wonder what you think of this with regards to plastic, which like you said, never, never goes away, never disappears, never dissolves. And when it gets ingested and recycled in the bodies, and how that might play on this distinction between the organic and the inorganic, and FEU as well. Um. Yeah, for sure. It's like there are degrees of exposures that vary from one set of people to another, depending on race, gender, or kind of intersections here. Um, in the in the in the work I was trying to do here was. Um, was to speak about exposure, but from a 
some kind of metaphysical point of view too, in the sense that you know, I was interested in how actually literally uh, plastic gets exposed through. Um, so uh, I took it analogically through uh, sun rays and how it diffracts. And as you just explained, uh, never really disappear, never dissolve. And also in its, in, in its, its, its exposure, sorry, through media and how, you know, digitally it gets re relayed um, by light once again through different different means. But so at this point, the, the, the tension becomes one about what kind of um, light do you get? What kind of exposures do you get? And so then the, the starting point of it for me, at least in the video uh, that I'm trying to make here, is to also um, to, to expose the bits of light that are present, but that, that are really struggling to actually go through because they are pretty much canceled by, by, the, by the huge rays of, um, of broadcast from other kind of media and again, homogenous discourse. So, you know, there is a, a text by um, Didier Berman on Pasolini and uh, Luciol, I don't know in English. And so, you know, I've been working on this through those, through this kind of text in the back of my mind of not being in the, the dichotomy of, of, of light and darkness necessarily, but how you have different kind of, uh, different kind of um, of emissions that also struggle to be to be to be seen in, in their own terms. So um, the questions becomes one of apparitions and how we actually let those apparitions kind of emerge by themselves without imposing some kind of um, huge light on this in the way that actually blinds everyone, if that's a, it's a, a pun that works. So um, yeah, that's that's the things that I, I'm work, I'm working with. That makes sense. Well, maybe I'll take this moment to to hop in. Hello, everyone. My name is Paisley, and Ruzba. I'm so glad for your your intervention um, in in the conversation. And while I was thinking and reflecting on the molecular composition of the body and trying to think of my body as a a series of, of communities all in in conjunction with each other. I couldn't stop thinking about the unequal waves of biomagnification that all living things are, are subjected to. And I feel like this connects a lot to your, your research on, on where plastic goes, where it breaks down, all of that, Marie, but also how certain communities in, in their proximity to landfills or runoff sites might be able to register their internal molecular changes in different ways because of other environmental um, stimuli. For, for instance, if you live near a dump, you're, you're very aware in, in some way of the processes of, of biomagnification infusing itself into, into your soil, into your water, because you can smell it you can see it, it's, it's this horrible, horrible stickiness. Um, and the communities whose um, homes and communities are near these, these landfill sites are, are often almost always uh, marginalized. And these communities also don't, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking from a Canadian context, but often these communities don't have political power by the way that the um, ridings are drawn. So nothing can necessarily be done to advocate for self and community um, in, a, in a larger way to maybe change these, these practices. But yeah, I, I was thinking about that a lot when you, when you brought up your comments. Because we don't feel biomagnification in, in a lot of ways, though it is happening, but sometimes we can, we can sense our cells changing, our body rewriting itself. Yeah, I also want to thank um, Ruiz Bay for your intervention and Paisley for your comments just now, um, because you're right, we can't consider the molecular without the sort of um, 
the legacy of racialized violence that has been directed to certain bodies. And I think that your point in particular about opacity um, and bringing in Glissant's idea about opacity um, is really resonant um, because, you know, although we are talking about this like sort of, um, in, in my case, cellular potential and molecular potential of sort of imagining our ideas, um, our bodies in sort of community and our cells and community with sort of inorganic entities, um, like Paisley said, not all bodies are equal through this um, systemic sort of racialized violence. Um, and I'm also really glad you brought in Catherine McKittrick to the table in the conversation. Um, and I'm also reminded of Catherine Yusuf's A Billion Black Anthropocene or None, which I think is highly relevant to this in thinking about um, the inorganic sort of legacy of um, geological mining um, and how bodies were considered inorganic entities as a way of controlling them and um, discrediting um, their humanity and um, basically incorporating them into the same level as um, uh, fecundable objects that were on par with gold and other rare materials. Um, so um, I'm really happy that you steered the conversation in this direction because it's absolutely essential to um, our discussion and it, yeah, puts, puts into light sort of um, what my conversation with Marie was sort of turning into and considers the sort of um, the, the inequality that molecular structures also possess. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I wanna kind of um, piggyback on, on what, what, all, what all of you just said. Um, you, you know, Paisley, um, you, you speak about biological magnification and I, I, I kind of wanna bring it back to this notion of toxicity because I think that um, I, th I think I, I think that Mel Chen really speaks about toxicity in an important way, um, and they they say um, I'm going to quote them because because this is the best way to go about this. But they say in a recent paper that it is a production of the toxic, whether or not specific chemicals are invoked that bears imagining in the whole. To only manage toxins as biochemical processes might be to unwittingly collude with the dynamics that produce them. I suggest, and they go on and they say, I suggest that the line between toxicity and intoxication not only should be addressed and rethought, in particular, I suggest that intoxication, rather than toxicity's absence in the form of non-toxic, be considered the unmarked as in the ambient or default variety of living. And so I feel like there's a, I mean, th this is a very critical disability lens to the thing, but Paisley, when you speak about bio, mag, biological magnification, I think, it, and, and I think this relates also probably to Marie's notion of immunity, but we think of bodies as the sovereign entities that must be protected from the toxins of the world, of the environment, this nature, this divide between self and other of, the, of my body and, and where it's situated. Um, but Mel, what I think what Mel is trying to say is that perhaps we are all, not perhaps, we are all vulnerable bodies constantly being intoxicated by our surroundings. And depending on where we, you know, if we live by a landslide, if we live in Gaza, if we live in a polluted city, the, the nature of our intoxication will vary, but also depending on whether we're immunodeficient, what our age is, what our biological making is. And so maybe this is a nice way to kind of blend in both Paisley's notion of biological magnification, as well as Marie's notion of immunity and how it's militarized and creates this dichotomy of the self and the other often. 
Well, thank you so much for, I, um, I'm afterwards, I'm going to email you and get me, get you to send me the name of this, um, yeah. Chen article, um, because I'm not familiar with it. Um, but it's making me think of Alexis Shotwell's writing on, on purity and how the idea of purity is always atemporal and despatialized and based on a very, like our, our current conception can be attributed to sort of like this moral Christian dimension of being sinless and something to strive for and attain. But what is it truly to have a completely pure body? And this idea of purity depends so much on purging and ideas of, of self-loathing. So I just wanted to throw ideas of purity and how toxic that idea is um, into the mix. Hi, everyone, just to bring the direction or the conversation in another direction. I mean, we've been talking um, a lot about waste and pollutants, um, mostly, well, except for lead that you brought up, of course, that we see in our everyday environment, whether, you know, most of us in the first world are aware of that we're using excessively plastic, sometimes out of necessity, um, like in a medical context or even a research context or others, but, um, you know, the waste that we're creating through it. But what I'm also wanted to throw maybe in the, in the mix of the discussion is sort of the question of the kind of pollutants or, or toxins that we don't necessarily see and sometimes are not even aware of. And again, there is, you know, different levels of that, but even in the everyday that we're encountering, and um, whether it is through medication uh, that obviously then are taken up by our bodies, but also things like our toothpaste, our shampoos, things that we eat that have um, been treated in a certain way. And they're also kind of working with our bodies and, and um, for in some ways to not a necessarily negative effect, in some other ways certainly to um, negative effects, but you know, it is certainly impacting us on a cellular level, um, but sometimes on a cognitive level and so yeah, and then, then the question of adaptation over time as well is something that I think might be interesting in the discussion. Since I don't think pollution is necessarily something that is a, just a modern problem. I mean, I'm sure if you would go back into the 15th century, um, there was certainly pollution of another sort um, that also impacted the body. So yeah, I just you know wanted to throw that into the discussion to keep things uh, maybe interesting and moving. And whoever wants to take up, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I, I have something that comes off the top of my head when you speak about adaptation to toxins. I think about the concept of hormesis, um, and uh, in Kelly Clarkson's words, "What doesn't kill you makes you stronger." Um, is basically what that is. Um, but you know, I, I think about how maybe some substances that are considered pollutants now were not considered pollutants before and how bodies adapt and interact. And this isn't exactly about a pollutant, but one thing that comes to mind in this notion of hormesis is the uptake of iron by our cells to create hemoglobin. And so iron is an inorganic component that was at some point uptaken by the body and became part of constituent of the body and necessary for the body's creation of life. So this is a prime example of adaptation to what might be considered a pollutant. I don't know, yeah. Yeah, I think the, the, the concept of pollutants, oh, somebody is speaking? Yeah, I was speaking actually, Marie. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Just because, yeah, I mean, all this I like, talk about the toxicity and the, and the, and the notions of otherness, or kind of like this ghost of otherness again, maybe to echo a bit of Marie's uh, provocation and um, how this. I think 
I mean, this, this, yeah, this iron in the blood creating life versus iron in elsewhere creating banality items that are, you know, creating all magic, uh, destroying the magic in the world or whatever. I think it brings up to me the question of context, of course, because I'm a sociologist maybe, but <laughs> I mean, obviously we cannot think of like an iron by itself is not a thing or a plastic by itself is not a thing as well as molecules by themselves are not. Maybe there are things because they're more physical objects. Um, so I'm thinking maybe Zoe told a bit here. And when she asks the oil is skin, and can we think of plastic as skin? And anyway, can and what happens then? Like what happens if we start taking care of or having a careful relation and an attentive relation with these uh, toxic members of our community, which is what is happening, right? It's like, why are you poisoning me? Why are you doing this to me? My body should be protected, or like we have this common. Uh, 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 way in which we handle our boundaries and why is this not respected by this capitalistic quote unquote I'm just just for the sake of simplicity uh, this uh, distribution and 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 production circulation and um, and of course we have this I think notion that like when we think of our cells as like communities of beings and cells which is I think the postmodern lesson has been learned right like obviously our cells are not self-contained entities like of Clinton would hate me, but as Kant had thought, like we're not just like eggs, right? Um, so, and also in the community, and, and what happens in the communities, I think this goes back to, again, sociology is all discussions around society versus community, as if community is this small homogenous thing that is very cute. And, you know, we love communities. We love consulting with communities. We love living in communities. Apparently we want to create a global village, right? But then we never think about the violences that are happening in the communities. And actually, most of the women's are, women are murdered by their immediate families and by their immediate community members. A lot of kids are um, put to work or, or turned into slave labor and human trafficking. I mean, there's all sorts of examples that I don't need to bother you with necessarily. So what do we do when our community members are toxic is the question. So like attending the plastic, in, in novel ways, in, in, in different kind of methodologies. What is it bringing out from that uh, entanglement that we hadn't, uh, that we could both engage with its toxicity while at the same, same time making room for its potential to be uh, 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 something either else, but if not just recognizing that it is within our community in the end. I don't know, maybe it's a bit too much a uh, community talk. <laughs> These are just like what I've been thinking is all these discussions were amazing, by the way. I'm so much, <laughs> my papers are full. But it seems to me it's also, um, and I, I agree with you, Jeda. I think you bring good points here. And um, my comment here would be to, to think about toxicity as being produced by the community from the get go. So um, that's also the, like, the circular thing, right? It's like toxicity framed as something that needs to be put away and thrown away as being problematic. But in, with yeah. that, uh, what, what would need to be, to be addressed here is the, the, the way the community also creates, necessarily or not, this, this kind of uh, um, toxicity. So uh, I don't know if there's a response to those questions there. there, there <laughs> they, they are they are pretty important and also pretty broad. <clears throat> so um, I don't know if in your work, Jada, because we've been talking about pollutants a lot and toxicity a lot. Yeah, but the I mean, ties yeah, into sorry. Exactly. No, I'm sorry. I'm thinking over you as a person. Um, but it's true. I I'm also engaging obviously with this question of like what happens when we render explicit what is actually experienced as implicit, which is a big subject in artificial intelligence. Obviously, because it's all about making rule based. Well, it's not all about that, but let's say in the early times, it was all about creating symbolic systems that uh, that kind of rigidly work in in a, in a homogeneous way, right? That was the uh, the idea, and the idea is again to make. Um, I mean, let me give you a specific example. It's going to be easier. I'm looking into common sense machines. I've been looking into them for a while now. And these machines are basically thought of as in knowledge infrastructures that are uh, that are planet scale, and uh, kind of like Intel. If like Intel inside, we would have like common sense inside our machines. So this is the vision of a common sense uh, 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 machine, uh, expert system actually. 
And to me, and this is such a big effort, guys, I cannot tell you, it's like millions of dollars. Of course, it started in the 1985. Now we're 2021, it's still ongoing. And it's just a huge mess of data uh, that's been uh, explicated by anthropologists and by linguists uh, um, through their own concerns and through their own lenses. Of course, we're not asking to necessarily count other people's opinions, but maybe open it up, open the systems enough for the interjection and for transformations, right? Uh, but their idea is to, again, yeah, make so many little like ephemeral things. For instance, a tree is, is, is green and it's, you know, uh, brown and, uh, and the table is something you eat with or eat on. And even just this example of a table is just irritating me so much because there are, I mean, I come from a culture where we don't have tables necessarily in my older culture. And then I know many people wouldn't also think of table as something to sit down and eat necessarily. But so this common sense machine obviously thinks that that's, that's what's gonna happen. And it's gonna evaluate your credit scores on the base, basis of the knowledge that you come from a place where you eat on a table. Um, so I think there is this, this is not necessarily about rendering explicit what is implicit, but I think there is a, uh, there is an authorization already ongoing in the process of this construction of this kind of rigid, flexible algorithmic system, which is both assuming a certain type of human to be, to be functioning and then also otherizing at the same move without explicitly, of course, saying that otherizing all sorts of experiences that do not fit into the mold of the machine. But then we all know, of course, these, these large algorithmic systems are kind, kind of coming to underlie all our organic and inorganic uh, uh, existences. And um, yeah, but then how do, how do we achieve a politics of visibility in this space is a question that I have. Like I'm right now part of an indigenizing AI research group. Uh, we're doing a lot of good work in terms of futurity exercises and all that. And there's a lot of good, of course, pedagogical educational opportunities coming up from indigenous community members, amazing work. But, uh, um, but how do we really deal with like this, 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 yeah, like are we rendering these, these machines as kin? How are we tending to them? I mean, these are all still, I, I feel like questions that maybe this conversation would benefit from your kinds of conversation for that reason. Especially in terms of coloniality question, by the way, Rube, thank you for your provocation. I was, I actually was thinking along the same lines, so I'm happy you just laid it all out very clearly. Uh, <laughs> it's necessity for some things to stay opaque, yes. But then how are we going to engage with the machine in a respectful, uh, recognizing and uh, um, uh, yeah, less damaging ways? Of course, that's what we're striving for. Um... I, I, I have something to say here. I mean, it's a bit of a <laughs> departure from, from where we were, but, um, but maybe, um, I, mean, I mean, thank you, Jada. That was very fascinating stuff. I think what I, what I know in relation to, to what you brought up and I think which ties in to the themes of this panel, I'm thinking about a recent article that was published in Nature's Journal of Medicine um, this past winter by a researcher called Obermeyer and Company. I mean, o Obermeyer is the name of the head researcher and it was other researchers involved as there always is. The title of the paper was called An Algorithmic Approach to Reducing Unexplained Pain Disparities in Underserved Population. Um, and what it was basically in a nutshell is that, uh, as you know, um, AI and machine learning is being used in medicine but perhaps at a bit of a slower rate than in other fields, um, because I feel like the ethical um, questions that AI in medicine raises are perhaps more under the lens than in other, in other fields. And um, I, uh, Ruha Benjamin, who, who writes about, who write, who writes about um, algorithms and um, algorithmic bias, racialized algorithmic bias has a beautiful saying where she says, AI is the mirror AI raises a mirror to the society which uses it. Um, and in the sense that the, the biases that we kind of, we fall upon when upon using artificial intelligence and machine learning end up being our own biases and the biases of the society we live in, right? 
you know, these biases don't get created and imagined by the algorithm. They're in the data, they're in the, they're in the code, they're, they represent the people coding it and et cetera and whatnot. But this, this study by Obermeyer was very interesting because what it did is that it, it, it started with a bias that's algorithmic, but that's not machine learned. And so it looks at radiologists' ca ca capability to detect knee pain due to knee osteoarthritis. And usually when somebody's knee hurts, you pass an X-ray, and then the radiologist has certain criteria to determine what the severity is. And that criteria determines whether that person is eligible for a knee replacement surgery or not. Now, all the data in the studies show that black people have much higher rates of knee pain than white people, but much lesser rates of abnormalities on x-rays. And so this is called the pain gap. Now, what Obermeyer did is that he used an algorithm also trained on objective um, degeneration in the knee, but feeding it subjective data of pain by the patient. And what that did actually is that then when running the algorithm compared to like a, normal, like a human radiologist reading, the pain gap closed, the pain gap diminished. And so what that means is that that machine was able to see something in those knees that the radiologist who grades the knees based on an empirically graded objective X-ray severity scores, and I know this because I research, researched it, derived from the study of white male coal miners in Lancashire, England in 1957, cannot see. And so here you have an example of molecular vision and AI machine learning that is doing something right. So I don't know. How does that feel? Huh? Do, is it threatening when like a machine learning is better? It's doing something? No, it's a freaking big relief. I can't tell you. Yeah, totally. yeah. I agree. Yeah. And also, I mean, to me, it's very interesting how like the, I don't know if it's again going on a tangent, but uh, how this, um, you know, especially the U.S. population and the society or the public discourse is so um, uh, shocked that their machines are biased, that their <laughs> categories might not be working, actually, that their taxonomies that go all the way to back to Galton and all those guys, right? Uh, uh, yeah, as if, yeah, as if there was somehow, uh, and, and right now, of course, the bias question is now trying to be resolved by adding more categories to the algorithms, which I don't know if really the way to go, because I feel like if you want to make an non-racist, like non-discriminatory kind of system, then maybe you shouldn't rely on taxonomies and maybe you shouldn't rely on such hard categories. Maybe there should be other ways of doing it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah totally. And then, of course, like without resolving the, the racializing tendencies of the structures that we inherit daily, obviously our machines are not going to stop being biased towards race. If we were biased towards other things, they would be biased towards them too. Mm -hmm. Which in this sense, there's this weird coupling between the human and the machine uh, uh, that's like this in, yeah, inextricable boundedness. But of course, the machine right now, I feel like is more of a symbol of, uh, of the of the Silicon Valley male mind, but it of course doesn't have to be, and that's the <laughs> all across the board. Um, but yeah, like what is it there that like, do I have to inherit the histories of the machine when I'm engaging with my computer? Can we have a more um, honest relationship in the sense that I know the rare earth minerals are extracted unjustly that form the, the chips in my computer and the, the silicon and whatever. Um, and does that, yeah, so can I have a different kind of relationship? By the way, in my experience, I cannot because these technologies come in packaged format. So there is, you know, unless you're a hacker, like an empowered, uh, technologically empowered person, there is no real way to also. So. I just want to add something again, maybe moving the, the conversation in a different direction. I mean, also like if you think of AI, but if you think of, you know, what we talked about, you know, 
I would have asked you about up, up iron earlier. And the true, the same is true for many uh, like uh, minerals, like selenium and others are exactly the same kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, we need them in our bodies, even if they're, if you look at it from a chemical point of view or molecular point of view, they're considered inorganic, but they're obviously infused in our organic systems. And mm. I just want to bring in the idea that really or just into the discussion and have people's opinions on on this that really the boundary between what is considered organic and what is considered inorganic is very porous i would say mm. first of all if, or even from a philosophical point of view we all live with the world and in the world so we cannot escape what we're living with and in um you know we've been talking about um plastics of course earlier on but there's all uh, that plastics is so durable and doesn't really die um, but I mean it does at some point um, we're all decaying and dying at some point and we're all being regenerated into the world just something sooner than later and I, again the boundary here is very porous and I just want to again throw that into the discussion maybe as a sort of uh, provocation for sure, for sure. I'm just going to um, jump in as well, just as a thing. First of all, um, I'm just going to thank Mary. She has to head off now. It is like 3.30, I think, at your time or 4.30. Um, so, yeah, thanks very much for joining us. If you have to leave, that's, that was great. Um, thanks, Mary. Um, thanks, everyone. I was super productive and I'm sorry to interrupt. Right, no worries. Thank no, you, no, Mary. No, no, we'll, rec we'll recover. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, like uh, Marlena, just actually on that point as well, it's like super interesting just because like the, I'm, I'm thinking about especially, I suppose, thinking further back, um, these notions of these byproducts and how we think about these byproducts. It was brought up earlier on and Marie brought it up, but also it was a few other people too. Um, this notion of, um, Jade, I think you mentioned it too, like rendering kin with them, um, with oil or like just byproducts in general as a thing. Um, and what do you, so what do you do with that toxicity, which seems, it seems inescapable that there is these necessary byproducts and maybe my brain was kind of, I was uh, just uh, thinking of it, um, association of ideas, like even as far back as say, oh, I'm just like thinking in deep time here, where like even the great ox oxidation event, which was like 2.4 billion years ago, where you have like suddenly that the, the change in the atmosphere, which caused this like great um whereby the um basically the um was it the aerobic or organisms got the um got the niche basically at the to the expense of the anaerobic ones um yeah and it was like i not to like i would want to keep the natural and social separate to some degree so as to not like naturalize racial hierarchies and whatnot as a thing that's that's obviously um but um, oh, also the audience is just coming in now too. I mentioned mental too, but yeah, as in this this really difficult situation of what do you do with this toxicity that is produced by a system? I don't have a definitive answer on this. I just wanted to put that out there as a kind of a, a way to think about, especially even with these these things that we just don't want to see these opaque kind of byproducts that are always present yet not seen. I guess. I mean, here I'm thinking a bit of Donna Haraway like staying sure, with yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean uh, but i mean it's easier when you're from like a university in the california to say stay with the trouble i think but i mean for a lot of people <laughs> not saying <laughs> trouble would be a lot better i'm sure <laughs> but if you have the privilege yeah stay with the trouble of course and go for but, it. yeah but also the trouble um uh you know finton during that that big the 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 um, oxygenation of the atmosphere. Um, yes, the anaerobic bacteria um, or the anaerobic um, unicellular organisms had a tough time, but what they did is that they ingested aerobic bacteria, which eventually became mitochondria, um, which developed into eukaryotic cells, right? So, yeah. so there you have an example of horizontal um, bacterial, I mean, Luciana Parisi speaks about this, right? But like horizontal bacterial sex, um, abstract sex, um, that, uh, that is a way of, of evolving without filiation. Um, and, uh, and I don't know where I'm going with this, but, uh, but yeah. No, no, I think that's absolutely at some point as a thing, as a kind of a, I guess it's mining these I, I really like that example, yeah, of kind of showing yeah, also how you can see these, uh, 
like, is that adaptation? Would that be called adaptation? You're, I mean, I, I, I'm not a scientist, so I, I, I want to watch. I, I want to, yeah, I want to watch my adaptation. words here. You know, <laughs> don't want to be one of those philosophers. Uh, <laughs> but it's an interesting point, I think, Fintan, and that brings me again back to the plastic that we talked about earlier. Also, um, and then Effie, your kind of poetry working on on, on cells and. I mean, if we, um, Adam Dickinson, he published a, a collection of poetry not too long ago, I think that it, I think it's entitled Blood. Um, his first one collection was called The Polymers. Um, but I think he, he actually focused on the sort of um, uh, chemicals that he found in his blood. And, uh, you know, and, and we find microplastics and all sorts of things, you know, Teflon, you know, you name it, we find it in our blood these days because we are basically living with it and surrounded by it. And again, it's, it's the same kind of porousness that you can think about when, of course, mitochondria um, joined with anaerobic organisms and then created eukaryotic cells. So yeah, just uh, bringing the, the, that initial point back into the conversation, maybe. Uh, Effie or Paisley, you want to talk about that too? Well, I would love to say a few words about Adam Dickinson's Anatomic, which is a fantastic collection. And I remember reading an interview with him a few years ago and like the polymers, his first collection that you just mentioned, I think came from um, actually working with scientists, going to labs, um, seemed like a very collaborative process. And with Anatomic, I think he was kind of excited by the process of it. Um, and so he, he takes his like samples of urine, fecal matter and blood, and then sends them to a company in the US. So packages all of it up, it's sent away, crosses a border, and then it gets sent back. And he, when he was reading his results, I believe that he wasn't quite prepared for how it made him feel. I mean, he obviously did the project because he's like, I want to see what's inside me because I bet it's some really weird stuff. Um, but it was, it ended up being quite, quite emotional for him. But at the same time, I mean, like I know that I have all of the horrible things that my mother ate and drank before I was born in my blood, but I don't actually know because I, I don't have access to that information without packaging parts of me and and sending them them off so none of this information is really available without reliance on an external system that is only made possible through these sort of chains of capitals and these different networks so all that to say I don't quite know how to feel I mean it's cool that Teflon's in your blood and you're you're still alive but also I'm, I'm horrified <laughs> It's a new kind of body horror, but could you make a movie about this? I, I don't, I don't know. And that's, I think the problem with a lot of um, movies and I'm going to go off on a very short tangent here, but a lot of movies are trying to depict different aspects of, of the climate crisis. A lot of these really detrimental effects, the things that we should be most concerned about don't necessarily make for a thrilling Hollywood movie. I mean, a tsunami, that's, that's one thing that's cool to see. But like communities slowly dying because of increased rates of cancer, that's not gonna get bums and seats. The closest you get to that is Aaron Brockovich showing that like it's a transnational corporation poisoning the water. <laughs> uh, but that's such a good movie though. I mean, <laughs> it is a good movie. But yeah, just to just to kind of echo what Paisley said, the the slow violence, right, is is the kind of violence that um, isn't often acknowledged, especially um, in marginalized and um, racial communities that are exposed to higher levels of toxicity. Yeah, so that that idea of time and scale is is very different. Where it, it's almost like we rely on the impact um, and the the event, the cataclysmic event, to um, make these um, these violences visible, um, whereas a slow violence is one that is, um, yes, maybe not as glamorous for um, our sort of consumption as a society. I think you have a very good point there, Effie, and, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, the interesting part is that um, before Adam Dickinson wrote us, there was another group of actually, actually of Canadian researchers at the same experiment, sort of, I think it was in the early 2000s, and they published a book called Slow Death by Rubber Duck. 
um, worth reading but horrifying in a different way than um, listening to Adam Dickinson talk about that that experiment he did. Um, but I think it because it is not glamorous and it makes you feel horrifying, just as your point just pointed out, Paisley, that people just prefer not to think about it um, because it is just too horrifying to consider what's in your blood, in your body, what you don't see and not to know what it does, I think, yeah. Which, which for me, that makes all these interventions, um, especially Paisley, when you speak about packaging and sending away to a lab somewhere to, 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 to get a result, it makes me think of, um, you know, we speak about time and scale, but what does that lead to? That leads to measure, right? Um, and measure, as well as toxicity, is determinant of a threshold. Um, and so what, you know, what is the threshold? What is the threshold of detection? And what are all the things that lie below this threshold that do not get detected, even when you package them and send them to the lab? Um, yeah. Yeah, thresholds are is an interesting word. I'm reminded of a book called Your Healing is Killing Me, um, which is um, by Virginia Grease, part poetry, part performance. Um, and uh, she is dealing with um, the sort of, um, the systems of racialized violence that happen in the pharmaceutical industry um, and the threshold at which um, we start to see um, let's say um, an allergic reaction to something um, and how this sort of like system of care um, that requires a very Western standpoint of um, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and sort of like participating yeah. within the system is um, deeply traumatizing and causes deep harm to individuals that are caught in these cycles of having to rely on a very disconnected pharmaceutical and capitalist system that um, simply uses bodies to, um, and often marginalized and racialized bodies to simply make money um, as just like another sort of in into the sort of um, what is in our bodies, these, these sort of toxic entities that are meant to heal us, um, but have the result just like the medical system of oftentimes um, creating deep harm for marginalized bodies. Yeah, I was thinking along that the the I mean what renders a system kind of more resilient or more like you know stable or you know with withstanding I mean this idea yeah I guess you said the, the what doesn't kill me makes you make me stronger kind of this Nietzschean notion that is so not true but anyway let's pretend that it is. Um, but it's making me think of Nicolas Taleb's uh, Nassim Taleb's. Um, concept of anti-fragile and yes, yes. Actually, you know you should have some kind of a small amount of, or a, it's not even a small amount but the moderate amount of toxicity so that you your system can uh, kind of uh, uh, it's as if your system would simulate some kind of a critical mass po point so like it's a moment of transformation like a threshold that you can uh, use in order to you know like propel the system forward uh, it being more so obviously we don't want fragile systems because fragile systems are too prone apparently they're too prone to breaking and then we also don't want rigid systems because then we have kind of modernity that doesn't work so he's thinking we should be then anti-fragile like kind of so this is a bit of i think a bit like neoliberalism on steroids type of a uh, conception but still i think there is some good uh, good uh, uh, food for thought there for sure um, yeah, like how can we keep this, like can toxicity only exist? I guess that's what it's making me ask. Like can toxicity exist again within our communities as a thing that is dealt with, but not as something that we inject so we become either stronger or weaker. Like, as, like again, the self-centric kind of notion, like can we break this and move towards, yeah, like how do we uh, again live in this maybe anti-fragility system, but necessarily for the sake of uh, uh, um, creating a, a, an opening and an expansion for ourselves necessarily. 
and it, it's ironic that Marie is not here because this, you know this, this fragility and anti-fragility and I'm glad you brought it up because it's a very fascinating topic um, I think the the bridge between that or maybe the analogy of that is plasticity right <laughs> and like Malabu's in, in like Malabu's work for example and Malabu's destructive plasticity and so it, it seems like an obvious connection circling back to the very beginning. Um, it would have been nice to have Marie's uh, um, perspective on on that, but yeah. Also neoliberalism on steroids, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it very much reminds me of the, um, the whole notion of anti-fragile, if you want to put it that way. I know that there was like a mystery in some sense, maybe some people know more about this than I do. Um, regarding it was about ant colonies and how like always the ant colonies that were the most efficient were also the ones that most likely to just die because of the they lacked this kind of the ones where most of the worker the worker ants were everyone was purposed in a very wonderful way almost like you know some sort of as I said some sort of a deranged capitalist nightmare of everyone just being super productive all the time um, those ant colonies just had a far less likely chance of long-term survival and it was actually the ones that had about a third of the colony not really doing anything or doing their own thing as a kind of a th um, were the ones that um, yeah if, if there was some sort of a cataclysm they were able to kind of adapt because whatever those ants were doing those third that were doing what whatever the hell they liked I, I'm deeply anthropomorphizing here I do apologize for that part of it um, but yeah, as in some of the behaviors that were found, the survival, requisite survival behaviors that were found for that moment, it turns out some of those ants were doing something like that. And as a result, those ants had a, those colonies which had that basically third, 30% slack had a better chance overall. Again, I don't wanna like, you know, just bring in science here as like the answer to these things. It's not like, um, but it is interesting, especially with Taleb. I mean, Taleb is no stranger to using these scientific diktats in some sort of a way, as a, and that is obviously a problem of our time too. Yeah, this is interesting. It's because bringing up to me like the the coronavirus situation too, and how our supply system, supply chain systems have suffered. Which was <laughs> this is still an ongoing debate, of course. But I'm thinking about the modes of production and how they changed. Of course, like this. Uh, uh, just in time, just in time, just in demand kind of production, right? That, that everything which relies on this, uh, uh, on the functioning of the of the supply chain systems without being interrupted. Because what happens in the production is, okay, I'm going to produce a phone today, and all the parts of the phone arrive at the factory at that hour for the production of this, and then at the other hour, the next batch comes. You know, so it's very just in time for sure. But then the uh, corona happened and the boundaries and, the, and the, uh, uh, obviously the supply chains have broken. So now the industry is thinking that we should move away from this. We should have cushioning a bit. We should not rely on these lean systems of inventory, but we should have a bit of redundancy and a bit of uh, uh, um, kind of approximation. Like we shouldn't also have our productions maybe like globally, you know, circulating. But maybe more localized forms, and and where yeah, again, like I said, the the um, the the third of the population can you know like sit and rest, and then maybe our system will be actually more agile in adapting into in the face mm. of catastrophic events. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's a little um, bit sort of not moving towards the or moving away from the idea of the survival of the fittest, you know, in a broader sense, kind of yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I think we are at our end, are we? Or did you have something Close. to say, Marina? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Usually your appearance is a sign for that. <laughs> Great. No, that's Sorry, right. That's... I'm just looking at the clock. So if you have some closing words, Fintan, go for it. Oh, no, well, not really. I mean, I think I have uh, just some thank yous. Um, unless Marlena, you have anything to say as a wrap up? Uh, not really. I mean, I, I just, again, want to thank everybody for you know, today's panel, it was a great discussion and also obviously all the previous panelists and, and, uh, and also audience members who joined and participated in the discussion before that. And obviously you from Four Space for helping to set this all up. We wouldn't have, wouldn't have been able to do it without you. Um, and obviously the CP for, uh, for hosting this and um, the Faculty of Arts and Science for giving us funding for um, setting up the Expanded Poetics uh, <laughs> Dialogues project. So, Yes, Fintan, anything 
No, I think you got it all. And again, just a big thank you to all of our participants today and all of our participants throughout the um, the events. You, Fort Space, I believe, has put the the videos up of both, and this one will be up as well, so you can watch it back if you if you if you if you, if you so desire. Um, believe me, it does look different when you're when you're passive. Um, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, uh, and thanks again. I'm going to pass on my thanks to Anna and Doug again for keeping keeping the show running in the background. Could not have done it without you two. <sighs> Well, thank you both and thanks to all the speakers today. And indeed, uh, in fact, these conversations are getting quite a bit of traction up on the YouTube channel. So we're glad to have the recording and uh, pull little clips out to um, allow lead people to the longer conversations. Thanks again. What a great way to spend this uh, Monday afternoon. We really appreciate your time, your energy, and of course, all of your wonderful ideas. So on that note, folks, we're going to close things up and hope to work with you again in the future. Look us up at uh, Concordia University for Space and subscribe to our channel. I can't believe I just said that. OK, well, have a great afternoon. Talk to you Thanks, soon. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.